My goodness, all I can say after that is that was awesome. I'm sorry to bore you now after all that. (laughs) Good goodness gracious. All right, well, let's turn in our Bibles, if we could, to the book of Genesis, chapter 12, and verse 1. The title of our message this morning is A Promise is a Promise. A Promise is a Promise. And we have, look at this, y'all, we have completed Genesis 1 through 11. Can you believe it? (laughs) So we're completely finished with talking about four events, creation, fall, flood, national dispersion, or now resident experts and all of that. Amen. But a promise through all of those events has been traced. This promise of a coming Messiah. And beginning in chapter 12, now we just learn, we begin to learn about the nation that will beget or bring forth this promise. The nation of Israel. So the focus now moves away from four events to four people. Instead of creation, fall, flood, national dispersion, now it's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The beginning of and the preservation of a very special nation called the nation of Israel, the only nation that has ever existed in human history that God himself created. Isaiah 43 verse 1, created directly Not indirectly through the Tower of Babel, but directly through the creative energy of God. And as we begin to look at the beginning of the life of Abraham, we saw in our last time together a new record, a new family, a new crisis, a new journey, a death. That takes us out of chapter 11 into chapter 12, and here we begin to look at new promises. This nation wouldn't exist without the direct promises of God, and we read about those here in chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, verses that we're going to look at this morning. Notice, if you will, Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, That formula is going to be used seven times in the book of Genesis to describe God's revelation to a man named Abram. Abram is blessed of God because he is receiving from God direct revelation. And the rest of the verse says, the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country, from your relatives, And from your father's house. So you'll notice this expression here, go forth from, go out of. The idea here is to separate. And when a person begins, when a person gets saved through faith alone in Christ alone, and they begin to follow the leadership of Jesus Christ in the walk of progressive sanctification, one of the things you'll see naturally taking place in your life is separation. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 says, come out from among them and be ye separate. It's this idea that I'm not going to laugh at the jokes I used to laugh at before, I'm not going to hang with the crowd I used to hang with other than evangelism. I'm not going to allow their values to influence me. And sometimes it can be sort of a lonely experience walking with the Lord. But it's natural. It's normal. And it's what the Lord uses, uses to prepare us for greater things. It's interesting that whenever you give something up, whenever the Lord asks you to give something up, a habit... Uh, Anything that we're doing, I have discovered through personal discovery that God always will replace it with something better. I've noticed God is not so much in the business of saying no as he is in the business of saying better. 
I want to replace that thing, whatever it is you were holding on to, with something far greater and far better. But I can't bless you. I can't bless a, I can't fill a cup that's full. Um, I've got to empty the cup first so I can put my living water in that cup. It's hard for God to put things in our hands when our fists are clenched onto something and tightly grabbing something. And the Lord will just sort of gently loosen our grip on things. And we start to hold on to the things of this world with a, a bit lesser grip than we did before. But that's all the work of God. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And God has something greater and better for you. So what is Abraham, or now his name is just Abram, what is he to separate himself from? Three things. Number one, his country. The Ur of the Chaldeans which was his place of security, it's his place of familiarity, it was his place of prosperity, and the Lord says, you're going to leave that now, and you're going to follow me. So number one, you're going to separate yourself from your own country. Number two, you're going to separate yourself from your own relatives, from your kindred, uh, from your fellow citizens. And then number three, there in verse one, you're going to separate yourself from your father's house, your household, your own family. You know, Jesus in the walk of discipleship, which is only for a believer, um, Jesus made the point, you know, that when you put your desires of your parents over the desires of him for your life, you can't be his disciple. He didn't say you can't be a believer, but he said you just can't be my disciple. And so sometimes this walk of sanctification involves that, where you start to see conflicts between what the Lord is calling you to do and what your family wants you to do, and you have to start making a decision. You know, that's tough, it's never fun, but it's normal. Uh, it's natural in the walk of progressive sanctification. And this is what Abram here is uh, experiencing. So where is he going? It's at the end of verse 3. To the land which I will show you. Notice he doesn't say, okay, we're going to Canaan. Now that is revealed in the prior chapter, but it isn't revealed here. And Abram probably wanted a road map. He wanted uh, Mapsco, you know, he wanted Google Maps. Um, he wanted to know where his destination was going. And God says, I'm, you know, don't worry about that. You don't have to worry about the destination if you, trust, if you trust your guide. And we are an awful lot like that. We want to know where we're going, when things are going to happen, what is going to happen in this circumstance, what is going to happen in that circumstance. And we ask God for answers, and God doesn't say anything. <laughs> he says, trust me. Um, which is hard for us, because when you're first becoming familiar with the Lord, sometimes it's hard to trust him. We're used to trusting ourselves. But the truth of the matter is, if I'm driving with a really good guide, and I did yesterday because I came back to uh, IAH, Bush International, about 11 at night, and I uh, flew into Houston and I parked in a brand new place called the parking spot, which is huge. And on the way out, I forgot to get my ticket to where my car was parked. And so we're getting on the little thing, the little shuttle, and the guy's taking tickets. And um, he says to me, where was your, where's your ticket? And I said, you know, they, I don't have one. Now, the guy at that point could have made or broke me. But what he said is, don't worry, sir. We'll find your car. And he, just the nicest, nicest guy. Then he said to me, by the way, if you had another driver, he wouldn't be so nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there we went, um, circling through this parking lot. It must have been a good 20 minutes with me sitting in the front, beeping my keys, <laughs> looking for the headlights to go on. 
But the good news is we found the car. But I, I trusted what was happening because I trusted this guy that was my driver. And I, I said to him afterwards, I said, they should make you the president of this whole company. <laughs> then I actually said, you know, you're the, you're the kind of person I would love to marry my daughter one day. <laughs> now, you're a bit old for her right now. She's <laughs> only 15. But if I was going to pick someone... <laughs> To marry my daughter, you'd be the guy. So I, I just calmed down because I trusted him. And um, that's how the Lord is. If you trust him, he's going to get you to your destination. It's just a matter of relaxing, calming down. <clears throat> God can't lie. And he calls us into that walk of faith. The book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8 says, By faith... Abraham, when he, is, when he was called, obeyed to go out to a place he was to receive for an inheritance, yet he went out not knowing where he was going. That's how God works. If God gave you the destination, you wouldn't really have to trust him, would you? You'd be trusting Google Maps or Mapsco. Or you'd be trusting your car keys, as I was sort of doing last night. And if God doesn't put us in circumstances like this, how can that faith muscle, which we've already exercised to become believers in the first place, how could that muscle be developed? God wants to develop that faith muscle because it says in Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to be pleasing to him. So muscles can get very, very flabby when they're not used. I know a little something about that as well, which I won't go into now. But a muscle has to be put under pressure in order for it to develop correctly, to develop its full strength. And if God has your life arranged in such a way that you can figure your way out of all of your problems then how in the world is the faith muscle ever going to be developed? So he deliberately puts you into circumstances where you have to trust him. There's almost no way out. And he'll do this over and over in your life. Don't uh, resist it. Don't get resentful towards it. It's a normal part of the walk of progressive sanctification, which is what Abraham is experiencing here. And then we come to the very end of chapter 12 and verse 1. And it says, to the land which I will show you. And then what follows is verses 2 and 3 where he starts to give promises. Eight promises. And the mistake in interpretation here is people think that these promises are conditional. You need to learn the difference between a conditional promise and an unconditional promise. A conditional promise is one that indicates you get blessed if you do something. And there certainly are those in the Bible. The famous one is Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6, which says, Trust the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. So it's interesting you counsel people, and they're kind of upset with their lives, and they're saying, my path isn't being made straight by the Lord. Well, my question is, have you done the first three conditions? Are you trusting him, not with some of your heart, but with all of your heart? Are you leaning not on your own human intellect, but leaning on him? And are you acknowledging him, not in some of your ways, but all of your ways. And if you do A and you do B and you do C, then you get D. So the Bible certainly has within it um, promises which are of a conditional nature and a conditional variety. And so a lot of people read Genesis 12 verses 1 through 3 as conditional. Abraham has to keep the conditions there in verse 1. And if he keeps the conditions in verse 1, then he gets verses 2 and 3. This is the opening of a theological door that really needs to stay shut. It's the opening of the door into what is called replacement theology. 
which is the idea that Augustine taught all the way back in the 4th century. Sadly, it's the dominant view in Christendom by way of denominational affiliation. It's the idea that Abram was a good boy, and he did what he was supposed to do, so he got the promises in verses 2 and 3. Then you ask the replacement theologian, the idea that God is through with Israel, God is through with the Jew, God has no purpose anymore for the nation of Israel. You ask them, well, what about Israel today? And they say, well, they broke their promise to God. They rejected their Messiah in the first century, and so God clipped the cord on the nation of Israel. Replacement theology. So Abram was a good boy and he kept the conditions. The problem is later generations didn't keep the conditions and so God cut the cord on the nation of Israel. Basic replacement theology. And what I want to show you is that's an errant way of thinking right out of the gate. These are not conditional promises. These are unconditional promises meaning that their fulfillment rests completely and totally on the shoulders of God. And Abram really wasn't a very good boy all the time. His obedience is kind of like ours, partial at best. So he, for example, is told to leave his relatives. Did he do that? Well, sort of. But he took Lot, his nephew, with him. Genesis 11, verse 31. He was told to leave his father's house. Did he do that? Well, sort of. About a C plus, maybe. Because he took Terah with him to Haran. Genesis 11, verse 31. And Stephen's speech in Acts 7 makes this very, very clear. Stephen, the, one of the first deacons in Christianity, Christendom, the end, beginning of the church age, gave a speech before the Jewish Sanhedrin in Acts 7. It's a marvelous speech. In fact, it was so good that he got himself stoned to death for speaking it. So you know you're doing a good job when you're making people angry because God's word does that. We should be making people angry, not because we're lewd, crude, rude, and obnoxious, but the nature of Scripture is such that it is an offense. This is why Galatians 5, I think it's verse 11, calls the gospel an offense. God designed it that way. So when you speak truth in love to people, don't expect the world to, you know, stand up and give you an applause. God's word, by its very nature, is divisive. And Stephen gave a speech, and he goes all the way through Israel's history. It goes, oh, I don't know, 52, 53, 54 verses, something in there. And he basically says in that speech, weaving together um, Israel's history that Israel is a nation of disobedience. And, and this disobedience just culminated in the fact that you rejected your own Messiah not long ago. And his speech starts with Abram. And Stephen brings out in this speech that Abram's faith, the beginning of Israel's history, was partial. His uh, obedience, I should say, was partial. So this pattern of disobedience goes all the way back to Abram. He says in Acts 7, verses 2 through 4, And Stephen said, Listen to me, my brothers and fathers, fellow Jews in other words, the God of glory appeared to our father Abram when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, Go from your own country and relatives and come to a land which I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. And from there, where's there? Haran. From there, after 
uh, his father had died, God moved him to this country in which you're now living. What is Stephen's point? Stephen's point is Abram's obedience was about a C plus or a C minus. I mean, he left, but he didn't do exactly what God said. Now, that actually becomes a very big deal because if that is true, then the promises that God gave to Abraham in verses 2 and 3, which we're going to look at in just a minute, have never lapsed. If, on the other hand, the promises are conditional and everything rides on Abram's obedience, then subsequent generations of disobedience lapse those promises. But I'm, what I'm trying to communicate is the promises are not conditional. They are unconditional. And Abram was a good boy sometimes, but not other times, kind of like you, kind of like me. And this is all held out as a type, if you will, of our salvation. In fact, Abram disobeyed even the end of verse 1 to a land which I will show you. He went into the promised land. But later on in chapter 12, there was a famine in the land and he went into Egypt. God never said, leave the land. So he went into the land, then he left the land. And then he found himself in a situation in Egypt where the Pharaoh sexually wanted his wife, Sarai. And he basically, are you married to her or not? Because if you're married to her, I could kill you and then I could have her for myself. So he just started making up stories. You know, she's my sister, which was a partial truth. You know, Genesis 20, verse 12, I think it is, indicates that Sarai was his um, half-sister. So, and by the way, the chart that I had up last time, I probably is not totally correct. I think it indicated that Sarai was his niece, and that's the problem with internet charts. You grab it because it teaches a point, but then you didn't look at all the fine details. So it's a good chart, but the niece part, you know, I don't think is right, but that's another story. So the point of the matter is his um, obedience here is partial. And this is why God, at the height of Israel's disobedience, can say to them, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun by light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, if this fixed order departs from me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel will cease from being a nation before me forever. That statement was made at the height of Israel's disobedience when they were sacrificing their own children to satisfy the God of prosperity named Molech. There is no way that statement could be made. That if you want to get rid of Israel, just get rid, don't aim your rockets and bombs and guns at Israel, aim them at the sun and the moon and the stars. Because as long as that fixed order exists, Israel will always exist. There's no way God could ever make a statement like that if these promises given to Abram were conditional rather than unconditional. Conditional is you do X, Y, um, and Z and God does something in return. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. An unconditional promise is God's going to do it no matter what you do. Now, God has made you, as a Christian, conditional promises in the walk of sanctification. An example, as we said before, would be Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. But you should also know that he has made you unconditional promises. In other words, God is going to execute certain things in your life, no matter what you do as a Christian. The only condition that's necessary is to become a Christian, which involves believing or trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible is 2 Timothy 2, verse 11 and verse 13. Verse 11 said, this is a trustworthy statement. In other words, you can take this one to the bank. So what's the promise? Verse 13, if we are faith 
less, he remains, what? Faithful, for he cannot deny himself. There are an awful lot of things I can do as a Christian to mess up all kinds of things in my life. But those relate to the walk of progressive sanctification and temporal blessings. They, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, cannot undo the initial promise that he's made to you. That if you believe in him, if you believe in his son, you have the gift of eternal life. And you're heaven bound. Because you are, John 10, verses 27 through 29, in the double grip of grace. Nothing can take you out of those two hands. It'd be one thing to be in the Son's hand, but that passage goes on and says you're also in the Father's hand. And you're basically locked in. Because that's an unconditional promise. And you may make all kinds of bad decisions as a Christian. That may derail aspects of your progressive growth, and there might be temporal consequences, but those don't affect your eternal security, because that promise is not conditional, but it's what? It's unconditional. And so as you're looking at this issue of conditional promises and unconditional promises concerning Israel, the thing to understand is it's sort of a prototype, if you will, a prefigurement, if you will, of our own salvation experience. David in the Bible made some bad choices. What did he do one day? Oh, just little things. Uh, Number one was uh, adultery. Number two was lying about it. And number three was murder to cover it up. So in David's life, you've got just some little sins, right? Lying, murder, and adultery. And David experienced all sorts of practical problems in his life because he moved into the flesh and made those bad choices. I don't even like the expression bad choices. That sounds too psychological to me. He moved into sin. But those had nothing to do with his ultimate arrival into heaven one day, his ultimate arrival into glory one day, because those promises were not conditional, but unconditional. So as Abram is moving out, he's going to make good choices, he's going to make bad choices, which will bring either temporal blessings or temporal consequences, but they can't erase verses 2 and 3. Because those promises are unconditional. And that's why no matter how uh, rebellious Israel became, and she became very rebellious, and no matter how rebellious she is right now, you cannot clip Israel out of your eschatology or your end times beliefs because God started to make promises to the patriarch Abram of an unconditional nature. So here is the foundation of the nation of Israel where God starts to make promises, eight total. That's why we have entitled this, A Promise is a Promise. One of the things that's very interesting is God makes promises first. But later on, those promises are ratified into what's called a covenant. That won't happen until Genesis 15 verse 18 where you'll see these promises which are reliable enough in and of themselves because they come from God, you, you won't see them taking on covenantal form until you get to Genesis 15. This is sort of the pattern of God. God did the exact same thing with Noah. He made promises to him. And we know in Genesis 6, those are promises because God refers to the Noahic covenant as something future. And it's not until Genesis 9 that the promises take on a covenantal dimension in what is called the Noahic covenant. The same reality is happening right here. A promise is a promise, but it's about to take on a new dimension. 
called a covenant. See, Abram had two things. He didn't just have promises from God, which would be enough, but he had an, a, a covenant, a formal, contractual, binding agreement of promises coming to God to Abram and his descendants. Those promises are one way because God put Abram to sleep before those promises were given. Genesis 15. There's not a lot of conditions you can fulfill when you're asleep, right? Unless snoring is one of the conditions. So that is very important to understand. And if you understand that, it keeps you away from a lot of bad theology. And it keeps you away from this idea that, boy, if I sin, i got to perpetually doubt my salvation. Most Christians, as I speak, because they're so untaught on this, spend most of their Christian life wondering if they're Christians. It's a complete waste of your time to do that. If the promise of life and God giving it to you, once you trust in him, is somehow on your shoulders to keep it, then you ought to worry. But the reality of the situation is when God made that promise to you of eternal life, he didn't say, okay, you're on probation. You're not on probation. Now, you can wreck your life. You can shipwreck your life. You can do great things with your life, but it has nothing to do with the initial unconditional promise. And so that's why I highlight a lot of these things. See, see a good sermon like this, educating people on this, resolves a lot of counseling issues. Because a lot of people need counseling, and the reason they need counseling is they're fearful that they lost their salvation. And so they want to come and talk to the pastor to, you know, somehow prove to them that they're Christians. And we can just end the counseling sessions right now, can't we? You are a Christian. Period. It's resolved. You know, just, just accept it. And, and move on with your life. Don't spend your life wondering, am I saved or am I not saved? You trusted in Christ. He's promised to give you the gift of life, which, by the way, is eternal. That promise is unconditional. Now, now move on into your progressive growth. And you can do things that will bring temporal blessings in your progressive growth. And you can do things that will deactivate temporal blessings in your progressive growth. But it has nothing to do with your arrival into heaven one day. So, with Abram, what are these promises? Eight of them. Here we go. Number one is the promise of land. We saw that in Genesis 12 and verse 1. To the land which I will give you. The very first thing that God promised to Israel through the patriarch Abram was the promise of land. Drop down to chapter 12 verse 7. It says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land... So the land is a big deal. When we get to Genesis 15, verses 18 through 21, we learn that the land is going to be a track of real estate that stretches all the way from the Nile. This map here probably needs to be pushed further west. From the Nile in Egypt all the way to the Euphrates. From modern day Egypt to modern day Iraq, that land belongs to Israel. Well, let me correct the statement. It doesn't belong to Israel, it belongs to God. It's the only piece of real estate on planet Earth that God himself claimed as his own. And he bequeathed it by way of unconditional gift to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 23, as clearly as it can be said, said the land is mine. Now obviously today and in history in the darker area there, Israel is now occupying a small fraction of the land, but that doesn't change the promise the day is going to come in the millennial kingdom when the nation of Israel will have all of that light blue area. So everybody today is kind of hung up on what they call the West Bank, which is a terrible term 
because the West Bank is really not west in Israel. It's in the east. And so when you use the expression West Bank, you're using a politically loaded phrase that favors Jordan. I don't find the expression West Bank in the Bible. I find the expression Judea and Samaria, but okay, let's call it the West Bank. Everybody's worried about the West Bank. Are you kidding me? Not only is Israel and the Millennial Kingdom going to occupy the West Bank, she's going to occupy the East Bank. Now, tell that to the Muslims and see how much they like that. Let's stop talking about the West Bank. Let's talk about the East Bank and when you're going to give it up to Israel. Whoops, there's World War III right there. But this is what your Bible teaches. This is something that God unconditionally gave to the patriarch Abram. Promise number two is I am going to make you a great nation. It says, verse two, I will make you a great nation. So we now have coming into existence a brand new nation. Because back in Genesis 10, you'll recall, there are 70 nations. 70 nations that owe their heritage and roots to the Tower of Babel. Now God says, I'm making a 71st nation, which will be formed independent of the Tower of Babel. Because the Tower of Babel took place in Genesis 11, and God is now making these promises in Genesis 12. Why does God have to make a new nation? Because all of these other nations are corrupted from the Tower of Babel, and therefore are unqualified to bring his Messiah to the earth. So God now makes a new nation, a 71st nation, to be the channel of blessing to all of planet earth. Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse 5 says, There he became mighty and a populous nation. This is the only nation in the history of mankind created directly by God himself. What else is Abram promised here? By the way, there's there's our 70 nations Genesis 10, God says, let's add a 71st nation. What else is Abram promised here? He is promised personal blessing. Look, if you will, at Genesis chapter 12, and notice, if you will, verse 2. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. Promise number three is Abram was to be the recipient of personal blessing. What is that personal blessing? It is material and it is spiritual both. How do we know it's material? Because we have Genesis 13 verse 2. Which says, and Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and gold. Well, how did Abram become very rich in livestock and silver and gold. It relates to Genesis 12, verse 2, where God says, I'm going to personally bless you. Not only was it material, it was spiritual in nature because seven times in the book of Genesis, it will say, God said to Abram. God gave to Abram direct revelation From him, God himself. That's the place of blessing. And not only beyond that, I'm going to expand those blessings into physical things. What else does it say here? This will take us to number four. God says your name is going to be very great. Look, if you will, at Genesis 12, verse 2. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. What else does it say here? Number four, I will make your name great. It is very interesting that when you look at the three great religions of the world, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, Now, obviously, with Islam, I think it's a false religion. 
But when you just step back and you look at those three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the three great religions of the world that are probably doing more than any, anyone else in vying for the hearts and minds of people. It's interesting that when you examine those three religious systems, obviously I don't think Christianity is a religious system because Christianity is not a religion of works. Islam is. But when you look at those three religions, those three great religions, what you discover is Abraham's name is revered in all three. And that is an outworking of what God said would happen. Everything that God says is going to happen because God can't what? Lie. The scripture says it's impossible for God to lie. And so God says to Abram, your name is going to become very great. It's interesting that when you go back to the Tower of Babel, the prior chapter, Genesis chapter 11 and verse 4, they were trying to make a name for themselves. But they never did. The only name I know of coming out of the Tower of Babel is Nimrod. And his name means it's not even great. It means rebellion or revolt in Hebrew. They were trying to make a name for themselves. They were trying to make a reputation for themselves. And yet they made no name or reputation for themselves. The name or reputation that God bestowed on someone was through his unconditional promises. So by way of application, I would say this. Quit trying to make yourself popular. Quit trying to make yourself famous. I mean, if God wants to make you famous, let him do it and let it be kind of a pleasant surprise. You know, stop uh, acting as if the Holy Trinity consists of me, myself, and I. You know, stop pursuing something that only God can give. Instead, submit to the authority of the Lordship of Jesus Christ by way of progressive sanctification and say to the Lord, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And you might be surprised at some of the things God starts to do in your life. This takes us to what are we on here? One, two, three, four. This is number five. Am I right on that? So we have land, great nation, personal blessing, great name. And then he says here, you will be a blessing. You see that there also in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. Your name will be great. So you will also be a blessing at the end of verse 2. Watch this very carefully. God blessed Abram so he in turn will be a blessing to somebody else and my goodness has that not happened in fact uh, in the book of Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 23 it says in those days the millennial kingdom 10 people from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. God says, Abram, I'm going to bless you, but the blessing isn't just for you. It's for others. Now, it's not just Abram that's been blessed. Do you know that you've been blessed as a Christian? The book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed. In other words, I don't have to crawl to God and say, bless me, Lord. God says the bank account's already maxed out. Who has blessed us with, what's the next word? Every, that's a lot. I don't know what every means other than it's a lot. With every spiritual blessing, ours are even better because they're in the heavenly places. We don't give to get blessed. Do we understand that? A lot of churches teach that. Give to get blessed. Nonsense. We give because we're blessed. When God blessed you, watch this now, he didn't just have in mind you. He had all of the people in mind that your life would be blessed through. So, you know, you might have a talent in something. 
You might have resources above and beyond what you need. I mean, you might have a wonderful career. You might have this or that. And you say, well, Lord, thank you for blessing me. And the Lord says, oh, did I mention the fact that that blessing isn't just for you? I want to bless others through you. And so that's a completely different way of looking at possessions. It's a completely different way of looking at finance. It's a completely different way of looking at stewardship. It's a completely different way of looking at the use of spiritual gifts. And this congregation here is very gifted and talented in all kinds of different areas. Look at Renee here leading, you know, playing music. I mean, I can't do that. If you want me to do it, I mean, I'll empty the place out really fast. Even though my own mother was a piano teacher, which shows you how slow I am in music. I mean, I can do a few clunks here and there, but nothing like she can do. So, so how come she has that gift and I don't? Because God wanted to bless you through her. That's why he gave it to her. And whatever your area of gifting is, God gifted you because he wants you to be a blessing to someone else. It's not about all about me and all about the talents I have. It's about what God wants to do, not to you, but through you. And this is what God, this is the pattern of God. This is how God works. And this is what God said to Abram at the very beginning of the nation of Israel. He says, look, I'm going to bless you, but it's not just for you. There's going to be spillover effects to other people, which we get more of a description on there in verse 3. By the way, be careful about something. Be careful about asking God to bless you. Because the moment God has blessed you, and by the way, Ephesians 1 through 3 says you've already been blessed in Christ Jesus. The moment God puts his hand of blessing on you is the moment you have an adversary. Because the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, the thief doesn't pick on people that have no financial blessing. To some extent they do, but the real target is the wealthy. The target of the thief is the wealthy. The target of the thief is someone who has something to steal. Now that would be you, because you're rich in Christ Jesus. And so that's why in the very same book that says we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, that same book, a few chapters later, Ephesians 6, says put on the full armor of God. Why do I have to put on the full armor of God? Because now Satan is targeting your life. Why is Satan targeting your life? Because you're rich and you're a threat. And he has something in your life he wants to derail, to steal. Because he knows that if you start to walk in your blessings, you're going to be a blessing to other people. Satan doesn't like that. So he will begin to target your life. And so the moment God said this about Abram is the moment Abram became a target for Satan himself. And so God, in verse 3, has to give two more promises by way of national protection. You know, when you look at what the Hebrews have gone through historically, a lot of them say, Lord, I wish you'd bless somebody else for a while. You know, the nation that went into worldwide dispersion, the nation that survived the Holocaust where a third of them died, I'm sure many of them are thinking, Lord, it's great to be blessed, but could you please bless somebody else because I'm tired of being targeted and attacked. It's the same with your blessings in the church age. If you're experiencing spiritual warfare in your life, if you're experiencing resistance from the satanic realm, that is because you're rich. And now you have an automatic enemy. So put on the full armor of God. And so because Abram 
is in this place of blessing, God says, here's two more, and you're going to really need these two. So what are they? The first one is a blessing to blessers. Because as you go into verse 3, it says, I will bless those who bless you. You are going to need protection. And so the one that blesses you, I in turn am going to bless. You find this repeated in Balaam's oracles. In Numbers 24, verse 9, where it says, Blessed be everyone that blesses you. A lot of uh, people, it's very interesting, they try to figure out why has the United States of America been blessed the way it has? I mean, is it our economy? Is it our wonderful leadership? I mean, what is it that has kept the hand of God of blessing on the United States of America for all of these years? And by the way, if you don't think America has been blessed, why does the whole world want to come here? I mean, you you can tell a a nation is blessed simply by removing the, the walls or the gates around the nation. Do more people run in or do they run out? You lift the walls around America. Well, we don't even have walls around America, do we? Let's pretend there's walls there. You you lift the walls around the United States. Everybody wants to come in. Now, what would happen if you did that in Cuba? Iran. Saudi Arabia. I mean, there's obviously something very special. There's There's obviously something very unique about the United States of America because the whole world wants to come here, either legally or illegally, however they're trying to do it, they're trying to get here. What is it about here that's so special? Everybody's trying to figure that out. It's called American exceptionalism, meaning not that America is somehow superior to everyone else. American exceptionalism means America is the exception to the rule. I mean, here we are, uh, over 200 years later, functioning under the exact same declaration and constitution that we started under. France's constitution in that time has probably changed at least around eight times, maybe more. So obviously that what's happening in the United States is exceptional, meaning it's the exception to the rule. People will go on and on explaining why this is so. To be frank with you, I had all of the wrong answers until I was invited by a fellow prophecy speaker, uh, August uh, Rosado, to speak at his church in Rhode Island. And in between sessions, he took me to the congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, which was the first synagogue built in the United States of America. In fact, you could go there and you could tour it today. It's set up like a museum. And in that particular museum is a letter from George Washington who visited that congregation and wrote to them August 18th, 1790, after he had visited that congregation on that same day. It's a famous letter. In fact, this letter has been quoted in a number of Supreme Court cases, but everybody quotes the wrong part of it. They don't quote the part of it that tells you why America has been blessed. Look at what George Washington says here, 1790. I rejoice in the opportunity of assuring you that I shall always retain a grateful remembrance of the cordial welcome I experienced in my visit to Newport. The government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. That's the part the Supreme Court keeps quoting in religious freedom cases. But keep reading. May the children of the stock 
of Abraham, aren't those the Hebrews? Who dwell in this land, continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants while everyone, now look at this, George Washington's quoting the Bible. In fact, when he quotes the Bible, I think he's quoting the book of Micah. Why doesn't he say the book of Micah? Well, because everybody, it would be redundant. Everybody knew what part of the Bible he was quoting. That's how scripturally literate that population was. While everyone shall sit in safety under his own uh, vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. Close quote. In other words, George Washington, the federal head of the United States of America, said to the Jewish people, you can worship as you want in the United States. We're not going to harass you. We're not going to Ill illegalize what you're doing. We're not going to throw you in jail because America is about sitting in safety under your own fine and fig tree and none shall make him afraid. You have to understand what the Jewish people went through historically. When they were kicked out of their homeland into worldwide dispersion into AD 70, you can document it historically. Everywhere they went, they were persecuted. George Washington says it will not be that way in the United States. God, I believe, acts through federal heads. George Washington was our acting federal head, the father of our nation. And he blessed Israel the Jewish people, and God in turn put his hand down from heaven and blessed the United States of America from sea to shining sea. That's why I'm eternally grateful to August Rosado because he took me to see this. And it wasn't until I actually saw it that I finally figured out why America is exceptional among the nations of the earth. It is an outworking of what God promised to the patriarch Abram. So Abram, you're going to be attacked and you're going to be blessed by people. And I want you to know at the very front end that whoever blesses you is going to be blessed in return. But then God says something else. This takes us to number seven. Everyone who curses you... I will curse. Genesis 12 verse 3 says, I will bless those who bless you, but the one who curses you, I will curse in Balaam's oracles. Numbers 24 verse 9, it says, and cursed be the one that curses you in reference to Israel. In fact, we're just uh, starting the book of Zechariah Wednesday nights, which I would encourage you to join with us here in the building or online. And in Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, He that touches you, Israel, touches the apple of his eye. I would understand that as the pupil of God. You indiscriminately come against Israel through anti-Semitism, which is hatred for the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's almost like you take your finger and you jam it into the eyeball of God, and you're daring him to act. The Hebrew here doesn't show up in English, but the Hebrew here is absolutely fascinating. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you. There's a word for curse, kalal. The one who curses you, I will curse. Different word. See that? The first word means to treat lightly. You don't even have to overtly persecute Israel. You just have to come under the cursings of God. You just have to treat them lightly with less than they deserve. But the second word is much stronger. 
In other words, a light curse to Israel brings a heavy curse from God to the one that cursed Israel. English will not reveal that to you, but a knowledge of Hebrew and the original languages does. So Arnold Fruchtenbaum on this verse says, the first word for curse is kalal, which means to treat lightly, to hold in contempt, or to curse. To merely treat Abram and the Jews lightly is to incur the curse of God. The second word for curse is used, that is used in this phrase, him that curses you, is a different word from the Hebrew root ara, which means to impose a barrier, to ban. Fruchtenbaum concludes, this is a much stronger word for curse than the first one in the phrase. Therefore, even a light curse against Abram or against the Jews will bring a heavier curse from God. How literally do we take this? The one who curses you, I will curse. Well... In the book of Exodus, the Egyptians were drowned in the Red Sea, were they not? Why did God drown the Egyptian army in the Red Sea? He could have opened up the desert and they all could have fallen into the desert or into the ravine. He did that in numbers. Why not send a tornado, a hurricane? The answer is in Exodus 1. The Egyptians were drowning the Jews in the Nile. God says, you drowned my people, I drowned you. Very, very, very literal, isn't it? Have you ever asked yourself the question, why is it in plague number 10 in the book of Exodus, God killed the firstborn? That's the plague that finally broke Pharaoh's will and he allowed the children of Israel to go. I mean, why did God do that? Why did he kill the firstborn all over Egypt? You'll find the answer in Exodus 4 verse 22 where God calls Israel his firstborn son. You, you, you come against my firstborn son, Egypt. I'm coming against your firstborn son. It's very literal. Why is it that in the book of Esther, Haman was hung on the very identical gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai? Because of Genesis 12, verse 3. The one who curses you, I will curse. It's in kind. It's return. In fact, the curse coming to you is worse than the curse you had originally designed. Human history, when you start to understand this, starts to make a lot of sense. Because every nation that has ever come against Israel, even though at one time they were a worldwide power, is now on the ash heap of human history. Egypt at one time was a world power. And they brought the nation into captivity for 430 years and they shrunk as a world power. You go right on down the list and the Assyrians came against the northern kingdom in 722 and so God shrunk the Assyrians as a world power. The same with Babylon, the same with Medo-Persia, the same with Greece, the same with Rome. How interesting is it that Rome at the time of AD 70 was a worldwide power? Latin was the dominant language of the world under Rome. They came against Israel in AD 70, and here we are 2,000 years later. Rome is gone. Latin is a dead language. Israel still exists, and Hebrew is a live language. I mean, it's absolutely, it's absolutely fascinating to study this out. Modern-day nations, same thing. Adolf Hitler's... Nazi Germany, the Third Reich, was supposed to last a thousand years. And he brought in the Holocaust and it was destroyed. Um, We can think of 
the English Empire. You know, what was the saying? That the sun never sets on the crown, the English Empire. Historically, you can study it. They came against Israel. And almost to the exact day that they started to make decisions against Israel is the moment God started to shrink their influence. The truth of the matter is, folks, I don't stay up at night spending a lot of time wondering what's going to happen to the nation of Israel. Israel's going to do just fine. She has a, a covenant from God. What I'm concerned with is the United States of America. It, it, it absolutely terrifies me when politicians look at the Middle East and treat it like it's the art of the deal and treat it as just if it's just another purchase of a hotel and another real estate deal. That scares the absolute daylights out of me. I have to be honest with you. It scares the daylights out of me when the squad, as our former president called them, keeps trying to change legislation to take away American funding for Israel's Iron Dome, which, as you can see from the map, they obviously need for, for protection because those green areas are Islamic countries. That little red dot is Israel. And to not as some kooky professor or not as some crazy person with a website somewhere, but a group of people that are duly elected, supposedly, and we won't go into that issue, <laughs> in the House of Representatives make on their Twitter feeds one anti-Semitic statement after another. And, you know, you just sort of wonder how long... Is God <laughs> going to put up with this? What's the saying? Those who don't learn from history are condemned to repeat it. It just seems to me that we're moving in the same direction as every other nation that has treated the Jews with light contempt, with heavy contempt. I mean, a promise is a promise here. People say, well, gee, pastor, how do we vote biblically? How do we do that? Well, here's one way to do it. You never support anybody, Republican or Democrat, and I can name them on both sides, that has any condemnatory word to say about Israel. In fact, there was a church in my seminary days in the Dallas area that brought in a missionary speaker that basically made the point from the pulpit that Israel in her modern existence is not Isaac but Ishmael. And what they were saying is Israel is a Zionist conspiracy, it's a work of man and it has nothing to do with God. And I was sitting in this church and I believe it or not can put up with a lot in a church. One of the reasons I became a pastor is I could, rather than listen to clean up someone else's mess, I could at least make my own mess. And there was a lot of messes going on. But when they said that, I said to my wife, that's it. We can't go here. We can't support this with our presence and our prayers and our regular financial giving because they have just crossed a line by saying this. And so you, you support churches, you support people, you support political candidates. I don't care if they're running for dog catcher on what they think about this. Because what they think about this will determine the direction of your country. Those who don't learn from history are condemned to repeat it. Fortunately, the promises go on, and we'll end with this one. The last promise, this takes us to number eight, is in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Number eight, Abram, I am going to bless all of planet earth through you. You will be a channel of blessing to the whole world. Blessed to be a blessing. 
Isaiah 42 and verse 6 calls the nation of Israel a light to the nations. Isaiah 49 verse 6 says, you are a light of the nations so that my salvation might reach the end of the earth. The truth of the matter is through Israel have come to the world through the three greatest blessings you can ever have. Blessing number one is this book, the Bible. Without God's work through the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we wouldn't have this book because every single writer of this book was not a Presbyterian or a Methodist or a Baptist. They were Jewish to the core, and the only one they even debate anymore is Luke, who arguably was Gentile. But Arnold Fruchtenbaum, in his new Acts commentary, gives evidence that even Luke was Jewish. Romans uh, chapter 3 and verse 2 says, To them Israel have been entrusted the very oracles of God. Blessing number two is the Savior, who was absolutely Jewish. He wasn't even a Baptist. Now that's fighting words in Texas. He was Jewish absolutely to the core. John 4, verse 22, to the Samaritan woman, a different nationality. He says to her, salvation is of the Jews. Romans 9, verse 5, of the blessings to Israel, Paul says, of whom is Christ concerning the flesh. Look at the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, and you'll see him Jewish. Therefore, we're starting to learn That it's through this special nation, Genesis 3 verse 15 is going to be fulfilled. By the way, folks, Israel is the gift that keeps on giving. Because if I were a replacement theologian, I would basically tell you that, yeah, God has blessed the world through Israel, but it's all done. The church has taken Israel's place. We have the scripture. We have the Savior. Thank you, Israel. But we've got it from here. Most Christians, by the way, by way of denominational affiliation, believe that. That's why when you take a trip to Israel, you need to go with the right tour guide. Because if you're learning from a replacement theologian, he's going to talk about Israel in the past all of the time. This is where this happened, and this is where that happened. But if you go with the right person, he's going to talk to you about the past of Israel and the future of Israel. This is where the temple is going to be built one day. This is where Jesus is going to rule the entire world from one day. Different perspective, isn't it? The third blessing is the kingdom which Jesus will orchestrate from Jerusalem, Isaiah 2, verse 3. In fact, in that day, the nations of the earth will not go to Washington, D.C. to worship the king. Thank God for that. They will go to Zechariah 14, 16 through 18, Jerusalem. Satan hates Jerusalem. That's why when he's let loose out of the abyss after a thousand years, he wages an attack on Jerusalem. What a nation. What a start. With these eight promises. You know, this idea, I'll bless those who bless you, I'll curse those who curse you. There's a descendant of Abram you need to bless. If you bless him by trusting in him, you'll be blessed in return. You'll have the gift of eternal life. If you curse him by not believing in him, then you'll be cursed. You'll be headed to a Christless eternity. What a segue into the gospel. See, this principle works out even in our personal salvation. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, bridged the gap 
between sinful man and a holy God. And he says, I want you to not trust in yourselves for your salvation. I want you to trust in me, which you can do right now. And receive the blessing of eternal life. If it's something that you need more explanation on, I'm available after the service to talk. Father, we're grateful for these promises and how you've worked in history because of these promises. Help us to be good stewards of this truth as we begin to track your wonderful work through your wonderful nation, the nation of Israel. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said.